You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. From Mamma Mia, you're listening to No Filter. I'm Mia Friedman. And do you know that friendships are just as important to your overall quality of life as choosing not to smoke, eating healthy foods and getting enough sleep every night? If you're a woman, you probably do know this. I know this because during the worst times in my life, my friendships have sustained me in a way that nothing and nobody else possibly could have. The role of my girlfriends is as crucial to me in my life as the role of my partner, my family, and my work. They are the four pillars of my life, plus my clothes. But female friendships can be really intense. They can also be nurturing in a way that is so life-affirming. They can be exhausting and they can be devastating when they end. When you're ghosted or when you're the one who sadly realises that a friendship has just run its course or has turned toxic or become lopsided. This episode of No Filter is about female friendships and what happens when you reach a point where it's hard to make new friends or when you can feel your friendships are becoming fractured by children or geography and when it feels even harder to keep in contact with the friends that you have. Romantic relationships pull so much focus culturally But our relationships with our friends and our friendships can impact on our happiness and mental health just as much. Which is why my guests today have made a six-part audio series all about friendship. Lee's Carlaw and Sarah Wills have become friends as adults. They're best friends, in fact, and they've turned it into a career. You might know them as those two girls. They work together hosting radio shows, podcasts and events And they've teamed up with one of my very best friends in real life, Beck Sparrow, to create The Friendship Project, a six-part audio series that dives deep into what makes adult friendships hum and the factors which make them unravel. And on this episode of No Filter, we have a very raw conversation about what happens inside, deep inside, female friendships. Here's Beck, Sarah and Lise. Now... Lise and Sarah plus third wheel back <laughs> over here. I want to ask you each how many friends you have and if you have a best friend. Beck, first you. I wouldn't say I've got a best friend, but Thanks. I would say that. <laughs> I would say. That was a test and I just failed it. <laughs> bam, bam. But I would say that I have a small group of women, like small in my life, but who aren't necessarily friends with each other, mm. who are the women that, as you know, you've taken my calls, that I reach out to when life's going pear-shaped or whatever, that I know will answer. And obviously there's more to friendship than me reaching out to people when I'm in crisis. But I have a small group of friends who – and I like How the, many? Define small group. Four. And have they remained fairly static? Like what's the length of friendship range yeah, they have. in there. So one of them I've known for 40 years, another one I've known for 30 years. How long have you and I known each other? So I'm the new kid on the block. We've known each other. Yeah, probably about that long. 13 years. But, you know, what do I say to teenagers? I have a close group of friends, but I'm friendly mm. with lots of people. But who are the people that I feel comfortable with mm. to call and say, the shit has hit the fan, I'm in trouble, mm. or that I call to share good news with? Well, you're on the receiving end of those Mm. texts. And let me say as well, some of these people I see every single Monday and others with you, I might see you once every six months and I might not even talk to you regularly on text, but you are still the person that I go to when there are big things in my life to say, this is something exciting that's happened to me or this is really bad or give me some advice. And I really learned that from Lee's, I have to say, that idea of, the daily, the weekly, Mm. the monthly, even the yearly friends. And it doesn't mean that they're in a hierarchy, but it's the communication styles or how people fit into your life. Yeah. I want to put a pin in that and come back to it because I think that the communication styles and rhythms and what happens when you have different rhythms Mm. to your friends. But, Lise, I'm going to throw to you next. Describe your friendship landscape. I would say 
I'm a bowerbird friend collector. So I don't have a big girl squad. I don't do brunches or race days. I'm not that type of person, but I have very close friendships. I would say probably in terms of a number, I would say five or six. Mm. I have two best friends and that word can be problematic. But I will say I have Sarah over here (laughs) and I have a primary school friend, Belinda. Sarah, here's a best friend she prepared earlier. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> What's your friendship landscape look like? I do like big gaggle catch-ups. I love that. I would say I've got two best friendships as well. I would say Lee's obviously and then another girlfriend of mine, Nadina, and then I have a spate of close girlfriends. I mean a spate of probably blowing my own <laughs> trumpet here. I would say I probably have three or four other very close girlfriends. Mm. Let's talk about that cycle and what you just said, Beck, about the yearly, the monthly, the daily Mm. and how geography can play a part in that. Mm. You know, you and I have probably spent a handful of days Mm. time together in the entirety of our friendship. How does that impact on friendships and how can that become problematic when maybe one person needs more than the other person can give. I think that's really interesting because I think part of it is the great thing about social media, because I'm going to bring social media into it and phones into it because obviously when people aren't living in the same city or even you can be in the same city and still not see each other, if you're not seeing them all the time, we're often relying on texting and messaging to keep a friendship going and I think that's incredibly difficult because it can tend to be quite superficial. The level of conversation can be quite superficial and doesn't always loan itself to deeper conversations. Mm. And I think as well that are we using social media to organise catch-ups to see people in person or are we using texting to replace seeing people in person and trying to catch up with people? Because texting is often like a series of monologues, isn't it? You know, especially if you're not doing it at the same time. You know, sometimes you'll be texting with a girlfriend in real time as she texts back. And other times it might be the next day. You know, one of my closest friends lives in Washington and and our friendship is kind of exchanging a series of links to stories that we're liking to read. But then that doesn't replace a conversation. Can that be enough nutrition for a friendship? I don't think it can be. And I think that when there's nowhere on the horizon where you're going to see each other in person, I think that's when we see friendships start to crumble or people drift apart because there's only so many hilarious memes you can send each other. What happens is that you don't have any in-depth conversations and then you find out, oh, they were in hospital six months ago or they went through some big event and I didn't know that. And that distance is very painful when someone that you thought you were close to is saying, oh, I'm doing this and I've done that. And, And I think as well, and something that we've acknowledged in the series, the longer you go without having a proper conversation, then you put it off because like, I don't, well, I don't have the time to have an hour's conversation and also they don't even know about dot, 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 dot. So I'd have to fill them in on that. So I guess, yes, you want to be trying to have regular contact and then trying to arrange to see each other where possible, which is why over the pandemic that couldn't happen. So that's one of the reasons we saw friendships really be tested and crumble a bit Mm. because people weren't seeing each other face to face And we had all these layers in there about, well, are you for masks or against masks? Are you okay with lockdowns or not Well, you and I had to agree to stop slagging off each other's premiers. We did. Because you lived in Queensland, I lived in New South Wales. We both thought our premiers were fantastic. It's true. And uh, we had to say, okay, Mm. it's a no-go zone. Lisa, I was going to ask you about phones and friendships. It used to be when we were girls – that we would be on the phone to our girlfriends all the time because there wasn't texting. You guys are younger than me, but there wasn't texting. And I know when you were younger, there wasn't either. Then texting came along, which I think has been a wonderful thing in many ways for female friendship. But everyone I know, every woman I know is really averse to phone calls. Are you a phone person? 
I'm a phone person with Sarah. I think you and I speak on the phone or, you know, on a WhatsApp or whatever, multiple no, times I a mean day. No, I mean phone call. Phone call. No, yeah, phone call. Like we a like to hear one another's voice. We even, yeah, we do. But that's very unusual. For most of my other friendships, it most of it will live in a text thread. But I think why, I agree. Why is it unusual? I want to ask you about that because – Beck and I, for example, will do anything to avoid talking to each other on the phone. Mm. Like one of us will go, let's make a time for a call and the other one will find an excuse not to. But Even if, though- if the phone rings, we know somebody's house is on fire. Yeah. So literally if our phone rings, unless it's a bum dial, it's like, are you okay? That's how we'll answer the phone. Sarah, <laughs> do you like a phone call? Yeah, I do like a phone call. Sometimes you have to be mentally prepared for them. I do agree. You have to schedule in a time. It's like, right, I'm calling this person back on Sunday when I have the hour to dedicate to it. But I think with Lise and me, because we're in each other's lives so much, mm. when we pick up the phone, we know exactly what's going on in there schedule. Yeah. There is no catching up to do. I think the guilt comes if you are making a phone call with somebody and you haven't heard their news like Beck you were saying and you've got news and then it just feels like this bigger than Ben Hur activity yeah. that you have to do. Because I want to just tell them something about my day but then I have to tell them this other thing and what happened to my child and I have to ask about their kids mm. and then they, I have to ask about their mum and their job and, but and I you're think like... That- <gasps> There's also a lot of pressure on, and I agree with what you're saying, Beck. and we know that it's true, to nurture a friendship, you need lots of tools in your toolkit. Mm. But I think using your phone and using text message can be really useful because it's about showing up for people and it's about bearing witness to your friend's life. And I think you can do that really effectively. We were talking about it. You know, if one friend will say to you, I've got this big health appointment next month or whatever, Throw that down in your calendar and when that day comes up, then you put that text out and that's all it takes sometimes to just keep the fire burning in a friendship because there is so much pressure on us to do it right and we do put the Hollywood treatment on female friendships. We do mythologize. Speak to me about that. Well, I well, just look at think- how, Look at the response that their friendship- yeah is really idolised in me. It's very Oprah and Gail, and I say that in a good way, but it triggers people, yeah. doesn't it? You talk about the response you get. Well, I suppose when Bet came to us with the idea about doing an audio series about friendship and she was coming at it from her perspective of speaking to tweens and teens and the dramas that happen and every time Beck did that, the mothers would come in saying, God, I, I'm really missing my tribe as an adult. For Lise and me, we would get messages from women saying, I really miss having a best friend. I don't Mm. have that friendship. I I feel like something's wrong with me. I feel lonely. And that has been Thelma and Louise, Mm. Sex in the City, even the Friends crew when they would all meet up at Central Perk and have their coffees together. That's often not the reality for most people's friendship structures and it's okay. And I think that's what we're trying to say through the Friendship Project. With your friendships, I know what you mean, Beck, about it being quite triggering. A similar thing happened when Taylor Swift did her 1989 tour and really pioneered this idea of the girl squad. And interesting whether it was a marketing exercise or not, and I'm a big Swifty, don't come at me, Swifties, I'm with you, I'm one of you. But it was the narrative around her was that, oh, she's had so many boyfriends. It was a very sexist narrative. And she was always writing about her boyfriends. And I think that she wanted to reposition her brand as being more about girls Mm. and she's one of the girls and she's got very close female friendships. And I think that was genuine. But the way that it was sort of manufactured on that tour was very triggering for people because it was all these hot, skinny, young, blonde girls. And even Lena Dunham, who was one of them, came out afterwards and said it made her feel terrible and she was on the stage next to all of these sort of Victoria's Secret model looking girls. Why is it that we can feel so threatened by other people's friendships? I think it's coming from a place, particularly now, I think people aren't being their best selves right now. I think people are pretty fragile coming out of the pandemic. I think that even before the pandemic, the research was saying that friendships are on the decline, that something like, what is it, 30% of Americans and probably Australians would be lucky if they could name one person that they would consider to be a good friend. We're becoming increasingly isolated. However, on the big screen and on social media, we see lots of girl gangs. We see the best friend or we see the Sex and the City girls having drinks on a Friday night. Mm. 
I think there's an enormous amount of shame when you feel lonely, right? So why do people respond to Sarah and Lee's with either admiration or jealousy? Because if you don't have that, you feel like there's something wrong with you. I think there's a lot of women. I mean, we heard from them who were saying, I'm friendly with people. I don't have anyone I consider to be a good friend. I don't know how to make friends. I'm socially anxious. My best friend dumped me. People, I've moved to a new town. All my best friends I've mm. left behind. I don't know how to People make are new lonely. Friends. Yeah, and when lonely. you say you're lonely, it is like saying there's something wrong with you. Now, of course there isn't because everyone is going to experience loneliness in, in their lives. But when you say that, that I'm lonely. It feels shameful. Sh- it does feel shameful. Equally, if you say that you have been ghosted by a friend or had a bust up with a friend, the shame around that is enormous. And we don't talk about this Mm. stuff. Nobody is talking about this stuff. We've put relationships in some kind of a hierarchy with romantic relationships at the top as if that's the be all and end all, family in the middle, friendships are at the bottom. They're the first thing we cut when life is busy. Oh, I've got the kids. I'm going to look after my partner. Well, I don't have time to see the girls. And there's no real support, I don't think. There's a million books on how to, you know, solve problems with your partner, yeah. how to get on with your mother-in-law. Where are all the conversations about how to have robust friendships, right? You don't have to have a perfect friendship. You don't have to have a friendship that doesn't have problems or fights in it or whatever, right? That's life. But this idea of having robust friendships, we know the research is there to mm. say how good they are for our health. I mean, you champion Female friendships. Not having female friendships is like smoking. One of the biggest health risks for a woman in old age is not having friends. Exactly. That means her health outcomes are likely to be much, much poorer. There's a research survey study from the University of Queensland that's just come out based on a 20-year study of a group of women, none of whom presented with chronic illnesses. And over the 20 years, they studied them. And those who said they had the most robust friendships, who marked them at a 15, I think it was, had far fewer chronic illnesses Mm. than those who rated their friendship very low in their life. And I mean, that says something. It's funny you were talking about this idea of what Hollywood shows us. And we've been working on this TV show lately and reading scripts and and I'm learning so much about it. And there's a good reason for that. And it is because most women have a number of friends, but when you're making a TV show or a movie, that's a complicated story to tell. So you end up having one best friend that stands in for all the friends, and we've done it on this show, like the main character has one best friend. Mm. And in actuality, she'd probably have a number that serve different purposes. Is that a true Of thing? course. Yeah. Well, that's what we would hope for. I mean, unfortunately, even when we researched our communities, we could see that there was at least something, was it 16% of women who said they couldn't name anybody as a friend? Except maybe was it their husband? Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's a little bit heartbreaking. That took us by surprise to not- 16% is high. Yeah. yeah. To not be able to name anyone. Mm. I don't know what that speaks to. Is it that we're less inclined to put ourselves out there? We don't even have the strategies. You know, you walk into, say, a work function or you walk- into the school gate and you're standing there alone. What next? How do you fast track a friendship? What Mm. happens when you click with someone? Mm. We've all felt that click with another woman. And then how do you make the next move? And I will say I've written about this, I've spoken about this, one of the best things I've ever done in my life in terms of stepping out of my comfort zone is befriending random women when I feel a click. And it doesn't always work out. We know that. Mm. But just to be able to take the risk and say something if you feel can something. Can you give us an example of, of when you've done that? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you I'm can. I'm a little bit addicted to it because, I mean, look, it paid off in spades with Sarah. Oh, I, Like she changed my life and oh, you say the same about me. I, I thought hope. you were going to talk about Renee, but I'm really happy that you've brought Mia. <laughs> no, well, that's an obvious one. But uh, there was a lady at Pilates, Mia. I, you know, I mean, I sound like such a trope <laughs> I was on. Lee Scarlett, suburban on, I was stereotype. On <laughs> and 
I had my uh, hands in the oh, short God. loops. I hate myself, but I did. I had my legs in the long loops. Oh, okay. okay. And we were doing happy baby, which is the worst position of them all, the most vulnerable. You're there, you're like presenting like a baboon. You've got your legs up. Oh. And, you know, it requires a lot in the hip flexors and your groin. And there was a <laughs> lady beside me who had been coming to the class, you know, similar class to me week in, week out, and it was just such a vibe, like big personality, always said something funny, friendly, open face. And did and you do a fanny fart? Is no, that where the story is oh going? No. The next day, so she was beside me in that happy baby class. The next day she's there again and I thought, stuff it, I like her. I like her. I need to mm. see where this goes. And I just said, to her, this is all I could come up with, how's your groin? <gasps> Yes, please. And she, and Write she that down, turned everybody. to me and I thought this could go one of two ways. <laughs> <laughs> and she turned to me and she said, no one's asked me that since I was on Tinder last week because she was a single. She was oh, this really bad. vibrant, single, that's 43. That's good banter. Great banter. So yeah. I thought, I'm in here. Uh-huh. I'm in. I'm in. And, look, that's just one example. But, yeah. you know, I've done it many times on footy sidelines at my kids' sport a click with a woman that I just think, I just want to see where this goes. Yeah. And you because- know what it reminds me of? There was a recent clip of Jane Fonda talking about female friendships and she talked about intentionally yes. pursuing people <laughs> that we have to in- <laughs> be creepy, intentionally pursue people that we want to be friends with. My favourite ex-husband, who's Ted Turner, said to me, you don't make new friends after 60, but I think that he's really wrong, that what you have to do is you have to be intentional, like... I never used to be intentional. I would meet Sally Field, for example, but not pursue her. Well, I did pursue oh, you. Oh, goodness sakes, I, I couldn't did. make you stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, because she tends to be reclusive. Is that and, right? And I pursued yeah. you. You totally. have to pursue people totally. that you want to be friends with, and you have to say, I I'm intentionally yeah. wanting to be your friend. And it works. People hear that and then they stick around and you, yeah. you develop new friendships. We got so many emails and we're still getting them of women who are very socially anxious or shy Yeah, who mm-hmm. are like, I don't know how to break into the, the mum group or at work or they're feeling left out. And yeah. it's unfortunately, you've got to be brave. And I think we all carry that baggage from school, right, about being left out, about being excluded, the fear of putting ourselves out there. I like to go on friendship dates all the time as well, and they don't always work. And, you know, I went on one one time and she just spoke about herself for the whole time. And I tried a few little bantery self depreciation and she didn't pick up that ball. And it was funny because at the end of the night it was kind of like, Okay, well, you know. Yeah. yeah. I'll call, so, I'll call you. Yeah. But also I think we've great. gotten lazy. Like everything now is immediate, right? You want your dinner, you order on Uber, it's there. Mm. You see a photo, you like it, there you go. You've put your two cents worth in. And I think there are a lot of people just waiting for a friend to waltz into their life. So I would further what Beck just said because you've also had the very sage advice of just because you're shy doesn't mean you don't do the heavy lifting. It's not up to people like Lee's to sidle up to you and say, (laughs) how's your groin? Like you've got to be receptive. And we talk about that. You know, body language comes into it. That's not even a discussion. Look up from your phone for a start. Yes. If you've got your AirPods in, if your arms are crossed, all those are physical signals to say, I'm not ready to be approached. And we go through, when we came up with the idea to create this audio series, it's not just us sitting around whinging, (laughs) going, why is it so hard? We go through the different aspects of the tricky parts of friendship, whether it's making friends, whether it's working through conflict, whether it's working out whether you need to ditch somebody. Well, let's but it's talk very about practical. some We've of those. We've put in practical mm. tips, I think. Let's yeah. talk about some of those. I want to talk about what a good friendship looks like, first of all. Sarah, what have you sort of learned about the markers of a good friendship? The markers for me are absolutely if a person is a vault, if you know your stories and your emotions are safe with them. The older I get, the more quickly I can point out gossipers and I just keep a country mile distance between me and them Mm. because there's nothing worse than feeling like you're hearing other people's stories that you shouldn't or that you find out your stories have been passed on to people whom they were never meant to Mm. be heard. So I think being a vault, being a reliable and being 
a bit messy. Like there is a great ugliness to real, true friendship, I think. They've often seen you at your worst. You've seen them at their worst and they love you for it anyway. Or if they don't, they call you on it. They're prepared to call you on it. I think that that's really important for me. After the break, Beck, Lee, Sarah and I still have a ton to talk about, including ghosting and the quiet devastation of friendship breakups. Beck, you have often noticed the people who aren't there. I know I'm jumping to red flags now, but notice the people who aren't cheering you when you win. Can you mm. explain what you mean by that? I think women in particular insert competition where it doesn't need to exist, right? And so I think then as well, sometimes you have friends, and we've talked about this a lot over the last 12 years, but sometimes you can have friends who are really great at showing up when your life is going pear-shaped yeah. mm. and to the point where they seem to be enjoying it a bit, like they're very good in a crisis. But you want them also to be the women who are cheering you on and wanting you to see you succeed. Now, let's just also say people aren't perfect. People have moments of feeling. I mean, we're human beings yeah. and we're flawed, yeah. right? So people can have moments of feeling jealous or envious and that's completely normal. And How do you manage that within a friendship? Uh, Envy look, and jealousy. Okay. So for things like when someone's having a baby and you wish that you were having a baby but you've got fertility problems or you're single and someone's getting married or whatever it happens to be. This is where I would hope that the robustness can come into it mm. and that we can actually have conversations where if the person who's got the good news can be sensitive at least and think, you know, this might be hard for you or I just want to acknowledge I don't want to put this in your face. You tell me mm. if this is too much because we don't have to be talking about my wedding or we don't have to be it's talking the, about my pregnancy. Yeah, it's the tricky conversation. I think another marker of friendship is can you have a tricky conversation without feeling like, oh, well, that's the end of that. If you can't come to a friend, and Beck, you taught me this when we were doing the series, a great one-liner and what a strategy it is, how to approach a friend when you've had an, an interaction with them possibly that sort of rubbed you the wrong way and you want to bring it up and Beck's line, do you want it? Do you, yeah. You, you, you so, will and, tell it better. So one thing I learned, so I, I did this course from Brené Brown in leadership training and was really designed for companies right, of when people are working together and how easily miscommunication happens and easily in friendships, right, is to have the courage to say to someone, okay, the story I'm telling myself is, so you know how this text message that you sent me, okay, the story I'm telling myself is, is you're a bit pissed off with me or I've let you down or you're actually not happy with it. Because you haven't replied in three days. Right. And so just you having left me that. Unread, yeah. and, and what do we love to do as human beings? We will fill in the gap, we will tell ourselves a story and often join dots that don't exist to make sense of something that's happened. And I use an example in the podcast series that I was talking to the girls about probably about money or something. I don't know. It was something big. I was talking to them and then I said something and then it went silent. Now, logically it went silent because so it was dinner text. time. Yeah. We're talking on text, messaging each other, and then it went silent and I was like going, oh, my God, I've said the wrong thing. Okay, I've, I've gone too far with something. Realistically, it was actually dinner time and they were feeding their kids and whatever. So I think I ended up saying to them, okay, the story I'm telling myself is that I have actually <laughs> crossed a line or gone too far or said the wrong thing. Here so you just surface it. Yes. yes. You surface because, your fear. But yes. this is yes. the thing we've also realised, and it should come as no surprise, but most Women especially are afraid of conflict, right? Whereas mm. conflict is really just trying to get a communication issue resolved. So if you ask yourself, and again, this is a Beck nugget, <laughs> is our friendship bigger than this problem? Mm. Then you've got to bring it to the surface because I reckon every single, out of the four of us in this room and probably everyone listening, you can think of a friendship in your life that has ended and it probably could have been saved by a little bit of conflict in the form of open communication. Because remember how we've talked about the fact that something that I learned when I started teaching boundaries to teenagers, if somebody is really ticking you off, right, and you're getting irritated, like I start going, I wish Mia would stop 
asking me for money. <laughs> Jokes. No. <laughs> <laughs> texting me all the time. Right? But if I said like, I wish you would stop texting me at midnight mm. or I wish she would mm. whatever, stop borrowing my clothes or yeah. whatever, right? What women do is we suck it up. Suck it up, suck it up, get suck it resentful. up. And then mm-hmm. get resentful. And then we go, oh, I've had it. We just drop the friendship. We either stop watering it or we ghost them completely. Instead of going, if somebody's actually ticking you off, it means they're crossing a boundary that you haven't communicated to them. You'd have no idea. Mm. So why don't I just say to you, actually, you know how you keep asking me to do fun runs? I don't do mm. fun runs. It's never going to happen. Mm. Right? So mm. don't ask me anymore. You know, and it's a bloody 15 second awkward conversation. That could actually salvage a friendship rather than letting things go pear-shaped. And I think this is all the stuff. I mean, our kids are coming to us with friendship problems. How are we meant to answer their friendship problems when we don't know what the hell we're doing? There's a lot of confusion. I think there's shame and then there's, I mean, I've had instances and I have really beautiful big friendships and yet sometimes I still find myself confused when a heritage friendship starts to fizzle. I want to ask you about the goat. Now, (laughs) you talk about conflict. Mm. It's interesting the way we used to be able to just accept differences and differences of opinion, but it feels like over the last decade or so, there are certain things that have become very polarising and have become almost moral barometers. So things like Less so in Australia, more in America, like if you vote for Trump or don't. With COVID, if you believe in vaccination or don't. If you believe in climate change or don't. Like, Are there some things that can fracture friendships and just not be redeemable? Tell us about the goat. I wish I had the answer to that, Mia. Okay, the goat story is I have an old friendship from when I was in my early 20s. We met working overseas and she proved to be a really good friend, solid How friendship. How did she prove that? Oh, over many years of showing up, being there when I needed a shoulder to cry on, being there for the good times, reliable, consistent, all of those things that you need in a friend. Had a lot in common, values yeah, in common. Yeah, 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 absolutely, all of that. And over the course of, let's say, 20 years, she is American. She does live over in a very conservative state. She's very religious and Over the decades, her conservative nature is now bordering on extremist, I would say. She is a health professional who votes a certain way, who doesn't believe in vaccines. There's a lot going on and I find myself super conflicted because I know she's a wonderful, wonderful person. I know that for a fact. I've lived it. And yet, you know, she will send me emails. So going to the goat thing, she will send me emails that are very steeped in religious fundamentalism and they'll start off nice. In what context? So she'll write things like, I read a Bible passage and I thought of you. And that's not uncommon for her to communicate with me like that because Mm -hmm. I know that's an important part of her life. So that wasn't so much of a red flag. But then it went along the lines of there are two types of people in the world. There are goats and there are sheep. And the sheep will follow religion when it suits them. And the goats will live that religion and the values and the virtues regardless of what's going on. I feel you're a sheep. I presume a sheep oh, is a not a good thing I, to be. I, don't, I believe that. Well, well, because it went further and it was like the sheeps all get taken to slaughter. Yeah, it yeah, was, yeah. come on. It was very, oh. yes. I mean, the, next the thing level. is, it, <laughs> it came from the very, place It sounds of, quite judgy. It well, came, I mean, but I got the phone call going, what the hell do I say back to this? <laughs> and what did you say back? I, <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is. It came from a place of... (laughs) She's very rarely speechless. You've done it. It came from a place of warning, which alarms me. It alarmed me. That's how I felt. I thought she actually thinks I'm going to hell. How can we possibly (sighs) be friends? How can she not know that I'm not a sheep? Are you really applying this to me? So I just sort of went back and I said... This is a lot for me. I feel like this is a really big issue for you that you're scared for me. And she was like, yeah, I'm scared. <laughs> you're going to hell. Yeah, I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of... I need to save you with Jesus. And look, that's sort of where we've left it off is that we've brought it up. And to be honest, I don't know the answer. I don't know if but I wait, can be friends. So then do you just keep going, so how are the kids? <laughs> 
I don't know. But then hot. Beck, hell's hot. Yeah, yeah. Like do, no, but seriously, One's like growing a was, horn. Was that the last? A communication you yes, had currently. with her. Yeah. I read it to a few other good sounding boards and just said, can I be friends? Yeah. I find it really hard to put an end to that friendship because. But maybe she's done that for you. So because I think maybe. By taking me to the slaughter. Well, I think that communication because I mm. have no issue with being friends who think differently to me, but I would hope that in the end we have the same values. We're living in a time where it's all about weaponised belonging. You're either with me Mm -hmm. or against me. You're either vote this way or you don't. You're either pro-masks or you're not. Or, you know, even with motherhood, everything is now you're either Mm. doing this or you're not doing that. But it's not even that. It's like you either agree with me or you're dead to me. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. And I think that's a really sad, dangerous place for us to be in. And I don't want to live in an echo chamber. I don't want to only surround myself with people who think the same way that I do. But we've never expected that until recently and I I find that generally within friendships and within families there's huge tolerance for difference right I wouldn't expect my friends to all vote the same way or think the same way but that might be your family I think there's probably I think there's probably a lot of families where there's probably not tolerance whether it comes to how you vote or your beliefs on vaccines Mm. or so I think that's a problem and I think that the more people are hanging on to things as part of their identity, and it is blowing up friendships. I think we're seeing that, that Mm. friendships are splintered because of this. And and in the end, I mean, you have never said at any point, well, this woman's like super religious and she votes this way, so I can't be friends with her. She's the one who's saying, actually, I can't be friends with you. Yeah. Right, and I think you can keep the door open, but you don't have to. And there's also the whole season, reason, lifetime thing, which is a handy speak about that. Well, I mean, I think we've all heard it. You know, people come into your life for a season, a reason, or a lifetime. Is that what it is? Yeah, correct. The problem comes when you think a lifetime friendship correct turns out to be a season friendship, and then there can be a lot of grief and insistence. 